I'm very embarrassed to, uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very embarrassed to be here because I know extremely little about category theory. And I feel, uh, you know, uh, out of my depth. <laughs> uh, mm, actually, for many years, uh, uh, Bartek said at the beginning of his talk that everything he learned about accessible categories, he learned it from Izzy Rosicki. I, 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 everything I learned, which is not much, <laughs> about categories I learned from Bartek, so it's like there's a chain here. Uh, I'm not sure if it completely factorizes because I'm not sure if I learned much about accessible categories from Bartek. But, uh, um, uh, actually, I think uh, <laughs> I tell you a story. <laughs> when I was, uh, I, uh, as, uh, up until recently, I, I was not very familiar with, uh, even less familiar than now, about category theory. And actually, uh, I, I didn't uh, think it could be applied. I remember at my, one of my first conferences, this was a conference in a uh, computer science nodding conference in Karpat. And uh, it was like an old style Polish conference where there was a lot of alcohol. And uh, do we had a banquet and then we started uh, to toast and then somebody had the idea to toast uh, uh, not f in favor of something but against things. And category theory seemed to be <laughs> popular favorite and we started toasting against everything we heard about category theory and this did, didn't end very well. So that was my main interaction with category theory. But then uh, slowly Bartek started opening my eyes and I think I, I, I have learned to appreciate some of the beauties of this, uh, of this language. Uh, but I still know very little. Well, nothing. <laughs> okay, to, to the point. So. Uh, the object of, 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 of interest, uh, the, my, my, my main interest is something called automata theory. <laughs> so what, what is this? So maybe uh, we study automata, but first of all, what do automata read? So an auto and this is actually going to be the main thing I will talk about now. An automaton is a machine, it's a formal model of a machine, mathematical, which inputs a word, like this, A, B, A, A, B. And then at the end, it says yes or no. So, there's various ma mathematical machines which do this. Uh, and uh, they recognize something called languages. So a language is just, you fix an alphabet, for example, AB, this is the binary alphabet, very computer science type of alphabet. And, uh, and they say yes, no, and, and the language is, is the set of things to which they say yes. So typical thing that an automaton might do, I will not tell you exactly what automata are, is it could say, word has even length. Or maybe it could do something like uh, number of A's is equal to number of B's. The typical finite state automata that I study cannot do already this. Or it could even say true fact of pan arithmetic like, I don't know, the Fermat theorem or something. Uh, so as you can imagine, you need more and more uh, powerful devices to, uh, to, to, to attack these, uh, these uh, uh, types of languages. And the ones that uh, I am mainly interested in are this. and their finite state device. So I, I, I purposely use the very ambiguous statement of finite state devices because what's a device, what's a state, and what does it mean to be finite? Well, 
that's, that's the whole point. That these, these uh, notions are open to interpretation and it's interesting to, to try to understand that. But let's begin with the most classical uh, if the paradigmatic devi finite state device. Suppose you want to uh, re recognize if a word has even length. Actually, the labels then don't even play a role. And then what you would typically do, you would have two states, 0 and 1. And then you are in state 0, which stands for even. You are instead odd, 1, which stands for odd. And you continue your computation, you update your state, each time you read a letter, and at the end, based on the states you have at the end, you make your decision. So that's a finite state device for words. And this is something called a finite state automata. Now, uh, automata have been introduced, are like one of the basic models in theoretical computer science, and they've been introduced, I think, like 60 years ago, or, or, or in, in, uh, in the 50s and late 40s, and there's been a lot of study, and uh, one of the directions that this study has taken is to uh, use objects different than words. So here is what's called a finite word, but you could do different things as well. You could say, for example, omega words. So an omega word looks like this. It doesn't end. So some people call this infinite words, but that's an inaccurate uh, uh, term, uh, uh, term, I think, because there's many different ways in which a, a word could be infinite. So, for example, you can have other kinds of infinite words, such as You know, your position don't have to be omega. You could have positions that are rational numbers. So you could have a word which, where the positions are rational numbers, and these are a little bit more challenging to analyze. Another direction of study, so people study automata which run on objects like this. They start here, they update the state. Well, now, to determine if you accept or not, you cannot look at the last state because it's not well defined, but there's some limit behavior, and this is a relatively well understood uh, notion. Already for other kinds of infinite words, this is quite challenging. How to define well automata here, it's really not, not well done. There's uh, it's known to be impossible, for example, for uncountable words. But if, if you're countable, then these problems have not been solved yet. If some problems have not been solved somehow. Another example is trees. So, what's a tree? Uh, there are lots of tree automata in the literature. Many people think of trees in different ways, so maybe uh, they have to be binary, maybe they don't have to be binary, maybe there's an order on the children, maybe there's no order on the children, and so on, and, but that's... Yet another example is infinite trees. They could be infinite. That, that's a whole big theory in automata. Yet another example, but let's not draw them. Yet another example is graphs. So I drew a planar graph here, but in, in general they don't have to be planar. And in all cases you could think of, of, of devices which input such an object and then say yes or no. And you might want to find, search for finite state devices, which do this. And uh, the theory has been living for quite some time, and it's full of devices. Uh, 
for Omega words like you have 20 models here, you know, <laughs> lots of models. For trees you have 15 models and so on. And I think it is, it, it would be, no, there, and there's a number of theorems which are proved for each device, for each type of input and uh, uh, separately. And some of them are really original, so require to make some new observations, but some of them are not. And it is useful to have a common language to uh, speak about all of these objects simultaneously and at least to understand the commonalities uh, uh, and, and, and see what is new and what is not new. And well, what kind of language is convenient for this? Uh, category theory. Okay. Uh, <coughs> So, categories as a common language for various kinds of finite state devices. Now, this is, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, yes, this has been like there forever. And let me just mention uh, one example in which categories are used. And this was already uh, yesterday in the talk of, of Thomas, which is co-algebra. I think I won't even write it, but let me just... Uh, uh, Let's look back at this picture. You see here this automaton inputs a finite word, updates its states accordingly, and then says yes or no. But in my examples on that blackboard, I said that instead of words, you could consider other objects. But this is not the only part of the definition which is subject to extensions. You could also imagine that the automaton doesn't necessarily say yes or no, but it could do other things. For example, it could give you a number. Or could have other more kinds of fancy behaviors. And co-algebras are very well suited to this type of discussion. So uh, the behavior, it's, I think, in, in my opinion, they're more suited to uh, modifying this than to modifying this. In my opinion, co-algebras uh, still maintain the assumption that the input has a linear structure. It's not completely true, but it's, uh, I would say it nonetheless. And yet the output behavior is somehow different. This is not an entirely accurate representation, but I, I don't think there's a good co-algebraic way of attacking things like this, or maybe even like this. Uh, the notion that I want to use in my talk is monads. And their algebras. So I will explain now what that is. I mean, I'm not sure, I don't think we're a very homogeneous uh, group here, so I'm not sure uh, if everybody is familiar with monads. So I will just illustrate monads on one example. And then, well, you can figure out, if you don't know it, you can f get a feeling of what the definition says in general. Uh, I'm not sure if my use of colors is, 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 is very consistent or meaningful. So. Consider the following, it's going to be the monad uh, I will call it like this. So I will just, the monad of finite non-empty words. So what is this? Well, first of all, for every set we sigma 
So it's going to be a monad in the category of sets. For every set sigma, we first of all we say we give a, we uh, assign a new object which is the set of non-empty words. So this is just by this sigma plus its computer science uh, notation which stands for all non-empty words over an alphabet sigma. So for example, if this would be a, B, then here you would have words like A, B, you know, A, and so on. I draw the circles for a certain reason. I will explain, I will explain this in a moment. Uh, so uh, the first part of the monad is you say what are these uh, things. Then you have to say uh, this is an, uh, an easy thing, a unit operation which goes you can view every letter as a special case of a word which happens to have one letter. So if you take the letter A you will have this word. Huh? Now the circle. <laughs> <laughs> makes a meaning, okay? And uh, maybe it is convenient while I'm giving you this example to try to think in parallel in your head if you have uh, uh, overhead processing power to say, think of in parallel as a different monad, the monad which associates to an alphabet all countable infinite words over that alphabet. Okay? So for that one it will be all countable words labeled by that alphabet and the unit will be the same because this is a special case. Okay? Now here is the most important part. You have to give a mapping such that if you get a word of words you can flatten it to just a word. Okay? So that's kind of, I will not, I, uh, yeah, I won't give it a name, just to not annoy anybody. So for example, if your word looks like this, the first letter is this word, and the second letter is this word, then you just flatten it. Okay? And finally, it has to be a functor, so you just have to, uh, for every function, you have to be able to lift it to to another function. Okay. So this is just. If you substitute for plus, you just, it's, it's just an abstract operation, that's a monad. Okay? You have to uh, give for every set a new set, and for every object a new object. Okay, it's going to be a, a uh, uh, and, and there's going to be these, these, these things. Not, not, and if you do it in properly in the language of category theory, you will have things like natural transformations and stuff like that. And of course, they have to satisfy certain axioms which you can sort of, you can imagine some of them. Others are maybe less obvious, but uh, yeah. That's a monad. And now if you look at all of these examples, they can all be modeled as monads. So, well this one, this one is kind of maybe the most natural example. This one is a little bit uh, less natural. Because the first idea would be uh, to have, uh, when you have your alphabet, then the, 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 the object that's produced by the monad would be all omega words. But then it would not be clear what the unit operation would be, because how do you model a single letter as an omega word? So what you would actually need for this particular example, and there's several solutions, but one solution would be to have a category of two sorted sets, where you have 
on one sort you have finite words and then on the other side you have infinite omega words and then the things work out so here this would be the category of two sorted sets here it would be the category of sets but actually now for these things it is uh, not at all clear what the right category is and there's several different ways you can model this as a monad let me focus on this one but uh, the only successful ones that I know would use infinitely many sorted sets the idea is that you want to put graphs together that's the idea of a monad I mean you put things together how can you put graphs together? I mean, okay, you can take their disjoint union, but that's not going to take you very far. So what you need, if you want to put graphs together, you need to have some like uh, ports such that you know, they're connected somehow. And then if you think about it more, you will see that you have to have maybe not more than one port, maybe more than two ports. So the category will end up being like for every natural number, you have graphs with n ports and, and then you can put them together. And once you have decided to do things as monads, then uh, oh, I erase this, then there's a natural notion of a finite state device. So define, I write definition here, it makes it sound like it's a formal definition, but uh, it's not. Uh, finite state device you know, over a monad T in some category such as this is an Eilenberg, is a finite Eilenberg Moore algebra So a finite eilenberg moore algebra is something like this. Uh, what's the typical letter here? Alpha? Or? Alpha. So an eilenberg moore algebra is something which takes the monad and goes in, in, into the, 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 there's like an object which is called the universe of the eilenberg moore algebra and there's like a product operation which does this. So for example, if we would take the monad that was drawn on this picture, it would be an Eilenberg Moore algebra, would be something which takes a finite word of elements in the universe of the algebra and produces as a product a single element. Now, an Eilenberg Moore algebra has to satisfy one or two axioms, and if you inline the axioms in this particular example, you will see that this is exactly the same thing as a semigroup. Now a semigroup, if you remember, it's a universe plus a binary product operation, which is associative in the usual sense. And if you think of it, well, a binary product, associative binary product operation can be extended to something like this, and this coincides with the notion of an, of an Eilenberg Moore algebra. So for example, for this particular monad, as your algebras, as your finite state devices, you will get finite semigroups. And this, this is a, a theme that has been very well known in, 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 in theoretical computer science in the 60s, to use finite semigroups as a computational model of, of very weak power, but, but finite semigroups. So this definition coincides with, with the choice of finite semigroups. Now, I said that this is not a proper definition. Uh, so what's wrong with this definition? I mean, what, where is it not precise? Here. Uh, this makes an assumption on what it means to be finite Eilenberg Murat. Now, well, uh, if your category would be sets, then you could say, well, of course we know.
this Eilenberg Moore algebra? Well, if an, finite, if an Eilenberg Moore algebra consists of a set with some kind of product operation, then a finite one is one where the set is finite. Well, that's a reasonable definition in the category of sets. But even in, we will see that this definition fails to extend to other categories in a natural way. But even in the category of sets, this definition is not completely natural. Why? So let's, 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 let's start with the example of semigroups. And we say a semigroup is finite if its universe is finite. Okay? Now, for a, a finite, the notion of finite semigroups should be defined in such a way so that there's like countably many finite semigroups, I mean, up to, up to isomorphism, so that you can represent them in some way. This is true. But it's not completely apparent from the definition, at least in the Eilenberg Moore style. Because if you define a finite, you take a finite Eilenberg Moore algebra here, then even if this set is finite, this is a function with, a, uh, with an infinite uh, domain. So in principle, you know, there could be uncountably many ways to define this. Now, if you do the math, which was done here, it turns out that the associativity axioms of an eilenberg moore algebra says that this is uniquely determined by what's done here. And therefore, actually, there's only finite way, many ways, finitely many ways to do it once you have fixed the universe. So that's fine. So there's so a finite semigroup, there's only finitely many semigroups. But if you take this monad, okay, then it's not at all clear. So this plus, I don't know, let's put it in a circle or something. So you say this is the set of all. In possibly infinite words over alphabet A, and you want an associative product operation, even if your universe is finite. There's no reason why there should be finitely many ways of associatively taking products. And I think it's not true. Uh, for as long as your words can be uncount of uncountable length. However, there is a theorem which dates back uh, to, to, to Shellac's uh, PhD thesis, uh, which says that, for example, if this plus in a circle is defined to, uh, to be uh, all uh, possibly infinite words over alphabet A, but of countable length, this still allows like rational numbers and stuff like that, then you can show that if you have a function of this form and your universe is, uh, is, 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 is finite, Okay, and it's associative as required by eilenberg moore algebra, then there's only finitely many ways you can do this. Mm, they can be treated algorithmically and things like that. It's not at all obvious here. So, you see, you run a, uh, it, it's, uh, and it could be false. <laughs> I mean, uh, so if you allow uncountable words, this goes away. So uh, just saying that your universe is finite doesn't give you the right, doesn't necessarily give you the right notion of finiteness. Now it so happens, and in many of the cases that people have considered, it does. But each time it's a non-trivial theorem. And typically uses some combinatoric results like Ramsey theory, theorems and, and, and more advanced versions of Ramsey theorem. Uh, that was for... Uh, things in category of sets. So for example, for omega words in the category of you know, two-sorted sets, that's still OK. I mean, there's still a natural notion of a finite set. It's finite on both coordinates. Still, you have the non-trivialities that I mentioned. But at least there's a natural candidate. But now if you move to uh, things like graphs, then things become really much more complicated. because your algebra will have an, infinite, an infinitely sorted universe. So you will have the universe on sort 1, universe on sort 2, universe on sort 3, and so on. When is that supposed to be? You know, you have an algebra like this. When should this be called finite? I mean, OK, a, a natural necessary condition is that it's finite on every sort. 
you could say, well, uh, you could say maybe a, a very strong condition would be that it's finite altogether. So there's like finitely many non-empty sorts and then, you know, and, and all of the non-empty ones are finite. But that doesn't, just doesn't work because for any reasonable algebra, it has to be non-empty on every sort. And this is a highly non-trivial problem and together, for example, with Bartek, we are working on understanding uh, what is the proper notion of a finite, what, what does this mean? What's a finite eilenberg moore algebra over monads such as the monad of infinite trees? And we still don't know. Uh, another example is what, so may, let me just write this question here. Hard questions. I wrote the monad of infinite trees. I didn't tell you what it is. So first of all, this is inaccurate because there's several different monads, but for none of them we know the answer. Another example is the monad of graphs. Again, this is inaccurate because there's more than one monad to model graphs. I would say that there's two. Both of them stem from the work of Bruno Cursel. Uh, defining uh, proper notions of finite algebras for this is a hard problem, a very hard combinatorial problem. I could make it specific if, if there was such a need, but I, I don't think there is. Uh, in particular, Providing a good notion of a finite eilenberg moore algebra for, for a certain monad of graphs would solve certain outstanding open problems. Yes, Michal? Uh, I think you haven't said which properties uh, should capture that finite. Genau. So uh, I haven't said this. Uh, and this is still not, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know that as well. Uh, but. Uh, here are some natural properties that, that should be satisfied. Number one, there should be, they should be algorithmically representable. So in particular, there should be countably many. But more than that, I mean, for example, you, you should have basic algorithms for things like, uh, uh, you know, given a homomorphism into the algebra, compute if there's at least one object with a value like this or that. A second criterion, which is a, a bit vague, is, is this. I mean, it, it's specific, it's non-vague over example monads. We don't have, I don't think we've properly worked out the definitional framework to, 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 to make it uh, specific in general. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not very motivated to do that anyway. I think the, the, the examples are the interesting ones. Is the following thing. For several monads, we have the following thing. Recognized. Ah, by a finite eilenberg moore algebra. Now, so for several monads and several definitions of finite eilenberg moore algebras, is the same thing if and only if in something called monadic second order logic.
So those of you who are familiar with this, it, the idea is that you can use formulas of logic to describe properties of objects like this, 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 or this. So for example, you could say exists a position with label A such that some later position has label B. And you could even quantify over sets. So you could say there exists a position, a set of positions. Uh, how much time have? Zero minutes? You could say there exists a set of positions which has only positions with label A and such that every other set of positions does this and that. This logic uh, is uh, so, and there's a, a beautiful line of results such that, for example, for first for uh, for finite words, what you can do by finite Allenberg Moore algebras, also known as finite semigroups also known as finite automata, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, because the equivalent ex expressive pattern is exactly the same thing as you can do in this logic. And this extends to finite trees, omega words, countably infinite words, and it's, it, there's a lot, of ex a lot of examples. So, when I write these hard questions, what I would like to have is that the finite eilenberg moore algebras should be designed in such a way to make this true. That's a, I don't want to make any sweeping claims. Like, I, want, I don't want to make any definitions of mm, general notions of finite eilenberg moore algebras for arbitrary monads over arbitrary ca categories. I would just say that I want the examples to have this property. And uh, to, to understand, to find a notion of finiteness, which coincides with monadic second-order logic, over these two examples is a very challenging issue. Uh, and in my opinion, the, no, the use of categories, these, these are problems which in some form have been present in the let, literature for decades. But I think giving, uh, using the language of category theory makes them uh, like, uh, better defined. Still undefined, but, but better defined. The success criteria are more clear. And uh, I find that quite appealing. Yeah, I think that, that that's all. Uh, maybe, no, sorry. There was one last thing I wanted to say. This is a, a personal remark. Uh, which maybe would be a, an interesting discussion in, in such a forum. So. When uh, Bartek was teaching me to use categories, you know, I found myself, <laughs> necessarily, I found myself drawing diagrams. I mean, that's what you do. So, you know, you draw diagrams like this. And, you know, you start to prove that they commute because something and something happens. And I found this to be, uh, I have strong and yet unclear feelings about this. I wanted to share them with you. Uh, so, first of all, I found this very addictive. Uh, because, yeah, I just kept on drawing these diagrams and I wanted to draw everything as a diagram. Maybe probably what happens to a novice at some point, you know, you want to learn to use your language. It's a little bit like people who write a novel without using the letter E. You know, at first it's hard and then you learn the basic tricks and you, <laughs> you, 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 you want to do it all the time. You want to say everything without the letter E. But but then I started to have, uh, uh, and, and it also has very, uh, it looks like it's beautiful. <laughs> and for example, it is completely verified. I mean, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I, 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 I don't want to be arrogant and explain to you the properties of, of, of categories. I just want to say my personal impression about them. It also has this, this amazing uh, property that it's completely formal. In the sense that if you draw a commuting diagram, this is a computer checkable thing. Each step of reasoning is, is, is computer checkable without, you know, without shortcuts. Uh, 
which is not the case for usual mathematical proofs. I mean, if you want to uh, formalize a, a computer, a, a normal proof, it, 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 it's, it's like every, every, every two words are like, uh, you know, a kilobyte. But I found it actually also a little bit poisonous because this is at least for me. I don't know. I want like, it's more like a question to, to everybody. I, I found that I could not actually do any reasoning here. I mean, I could do the reasoning like take an element of this, do this and that, and you know, see that after applying these functions to these elements, let's look what the element does and so on, then I end up with the same element. And then once I've done that, then I could only be, uh, then I would draw it as the diagram and pretend I didn't do the reasoning. And I'm just curious if this is true for other people. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to end with, uh, and, and, and I have certain suspicions that it might be, uh, because, uh, for some people at least, uh, because I remember uh, uh, a few months ago, I spent some time uh, uh, talking to Gordon Plotkin, who was one of the bigger, biggest researchers, a famous researcher in logic and computer science, and especially in, in, in using categories. And I was, you know, have just recently learned this categorical language, and I was trying to, you know, draw, draw diagrams and use, say things like, you know, use these words. And, yeah, no, and he went, no, 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 don't do that. You know, just take the element. And <laughs> so that was my, my impression that he was also uh, using the elements, at least in some cases. No, 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 in some cases he was not. But, uh, so I wanted to end my, 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 my talk with this question. Is this a language that allows you to discover new things, to, to, to get actual some work done? And I, I, as opposed to present work that you have already done? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a provocative question. I wanted to end with this thing.